Hi, welcome to Ability Fierce. And today I'm here with Cheryl Singleton Lynch, who I met at an OPWDD meeting. What is OPWDD? You don't need to know. But, well, you don't need to know everything because you just have to know that this is the main organization that provides Medicaid waiver services to children and people with disabilities. And we were at a meeting and I said, listen, are you looking at the impact all these changes are having on the families? Why can't we just have a system that works for the families? Why do you have to take on all this bureaucracy and become an expert in disability services? And after I said this, people clapped. And I, I was proud, I liked clapping. And Cheryl came up and talked to me. And Cheryl showed me, or sent me the next couple of days, she sent me the book, The Precipice of Caring. And I read it, and it was, it was my story. But it wasn't just my story, it was her story. It was the story of thousands of other disabled parents around New York. So today we're gonna talk about the impact of disability on the families and the lack of services and why we can't have a system that creates jobs gives, lets people be who they can be instead of me having it be that when you have a disabled child, you have to become a disabled advocate, an expert, and all this stuff. Why can't you just be a person and the services are there? We all know what people need. We can figure it out. We can talk and make them work because that's what they're entitled to. And it, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a crime that you have something that you're entitled to and you can't get. So now, bear with me while I do the TV magic, and you will see my guest, Cheryl Singleton Lynch. How are you, Cheryl? Hi, Michael. Good to see I'm you. I'm glad to be Let here. Let me move my leg over here. Okay. okay. So now we're talking like this. Okay. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your struggle or yourself, and you know how you got to the point where you were writing *The Precipice of Caring* instead of whatever else you might have wanted uh -huh. to do. Well. Um, I had my son back in 1987. Turn a little because I think we're, yeah. Um, he is a person on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. He has mild to moderate autism. Um, he's also slightly speech and language impaired. Uh, so we were dealing with that. And um, the first thing I noticed back uh, when he was about two years old was that his milestones were delayed and everything. So we took him to a doctor. I didn't even know about milestones. This is my first kid, okay, mm -hmm. and stuff. And nobody else in my family, you know, uh, uh, people of color in my day, in that day, uh, didn't talk about milestones, developmental milestones. It's like you had a kid and everything was supposed to work out great and everything like that. What do you mean the kid has a disability? But uh, when things weren't happening at the rate that people said they should be happening, I took Daniel to the doctor and we wound up getting some testing and everything and um, he wound up placed in uh, early childhood learning center and, and stuff. Um, what is I, the early childhood plan? Oh, uh, he was three years old when right. he went was to... Was this early intervention? Or early intervention, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Um, up in uh, Fresh Meadows and, and stuff. I, I'm from Queens, mm -hmm. by the way, mm -hmm. and everything. And um, he was kicked out of that school about six months in because his disabilities were too severe for the school to handle them. Mm -hmm. So um, I got really angry at that point. It's like, what do you mean you're not going to help me? What do you mean you don't know what to do? and stuff. They sent me here to you. Uh, it's like, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Um, so uh, gradually I found a more restrictive environment which was better for him and he made progress. He started to talk. He started to read and write and everything like that. It's been a long journey, okay? Um, the thing that bothered me the most was that um, I tried to work, I tried to go back to work because everybody was like, you should go back to work and everything. And I couldn't find a job that would accommodate uh, the bus schedule, okay, uh, the childcare schedule and everything. Uh, the jobs I found that might do that didn't pay enough. 
uh, to pay for childcare and still have something left over. And um, it, I just wound up writing because writing was something to get my frustrations out. And I discovered that I was still good at it. People told me when I was in school that I was good at it. I found out I was still good at it. I um, decided to do more of it. And um, I was also in talk therapy myself. Um, and that was helping me find a little bit more uh, about what I needed to do. I was getting my child help, but I needed help too. And that's something that I wanted to stress to parents um, that, you know, don't forget about yourselves in this and everything. My husband was working furiously, frantically, all the time, day, uh, day job and side business and everything like that. So I felt like a real single parent and everything. Um, it took years. Um, autism took a big toll on our marriage and, and stuff. Um, and it has also made me a better parent than I would have been probably if my kid didn't have a disability because I became more attentive. But the thing that discouraged me was that I would go to these meetings um, of agencies and uh, state agencies and private agencies and everything, and all the other parents were like full of jargon and stuff. All these acronyms came out and yeah, everything. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm thinking of getting a buzzer on this show. So right. Say, <laughs> no, you can't, you can't, you can't say that because it's, 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 um, it obscures the truth. Right. You know, if you say, well, uh, your kid is uh, I slash DD, uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it neuter neutralizes it. Right. You know, and, and, and they didn't seem like parents anymore. They seemed like you know, mini agency clones and everything like that. And I didn't want that to happen to me and stuff. I still wanted to be a parent and everything. I was looking for, um, for a while I was looking for normal and then I was just looking to manage and cope and everything. And that, um, this book is like a, a chronicle of my experiences coping in various situations. Daniel's 31 now and stuff. He lives in a residence in Queens and everything. I see him regularly. I talk to him on the phone. He emails me and everything. So like, yeah, there, there are happy endings, just not the ones I expected going into it and everything. But um, I've also done a lot of work um, with different agencies and stuff. I've had to be an advocate um, inside and outside for my child and for other families and everything. I've been up to Albany. Um, I would tell people that, um, you know, if you don't vote, you better start. <laughs> Welcome to the non-march at New York's Grand Central Station, a disabled friendly response to the 2019 Women's March as it paraded through the streets of Midtown Manhattan earlier this year. Enthusiasm for the march was somewhat dampened following charges of anti-Semitism among some of the organizers, and that led to a very public split among the broad coalition that joined forces in 2017 to protest the Trump administration. What got less noticed though were accusations that Women's March organizers are hostile to people with disabilities. The Women's March is great, but it could be even more inclusive. It's on time. to march. Yeah. Activist Jennifer Bartlett approached march organizers about including more people with disabilities, but when that went nowhere, she started a non-march instead. Non-marchers said they had been made to feel uncomfortable after discussions ended in threats of a lawsuit. Well, the local uh, women's march, my friend Jennifer actually asked for it to be more accessible, and they denied her and said, "No, it's my march, and we're not going." 
going to try and make it more and actually threaten to sue her for asking. So no, I would not have gone. They threatened to me because I said the leader was a young white woman. Oh. But she is a young white woman. Lacey Tompkins, who learned about the non-march over social media, thought the more inclusive option just made more sense. Um, I hope at the very least we can bring disability more into the conversation when issues like this are discussed. Um, so hopefully it's a step further. When Daniel had a real rough adolescence mm -hmm. and, and stuff, a lot of hormonal changes and his behavior became erratic and everything like that. And the school suggested that I get him some medication, some psychotropic medication. Um, the evaluations that I had to do and, you know, you have to awfulize your kid in order to get help. That's it. If, if you don't awfulize him enough, they won't medicate him and everything. So your visit is wasted and everything like that. And all those forms you filled out and all those people you saw doesn't matter at all and everything. And um, maybe if somebody had just helped me sooner uh, or easier, quicker, um, things might have gone better sooner and, and things like that. Um, I hate having to think that I have to say how disabled my child is, how dysfunctional my child is, before you will help me. If my husband was like hands off. He mm -hmm. went to work and left me to deal with the rest and mm -hmm. there was a lot of rest and, and stuff. Um, but uh, it's a full-time job in itself. Yeah, 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 and and things. But uh, you also have to like let go um, in the process and and stuff. Be willing to have other people step in when they can, and let go of the idea that they're going to do it the same way you do it and stuff. Because otherwise, it, it does become crazy making mm -hmm. and everything like that. Um, you know. But uh, I know in communities of color, people don't want outsiders necessarily to step in. There's an attitude that um, this is family and we take care of family and nobody else does and everything. And um, I couldn't do it. And I felt guilty for years because I couldn't do everything myself, you know. and. Um, Save yourself the trip. <laughs> yeah. My friends would talk about their average kids, their neurotypical kids mm -hmm. and everything, and all the things that they were doing, and it's like, well, my kid sort of says five words, you know, and stuff, and um, I couldn't compete, and I stopped, mm -hmm. and I withdrew and stuff, and so for a long time, the only people that, so you uh, withdrew, you cut yourself off from the from, social circle? From the social circle. Because you didn't want to hear. About, right, because yeah. I didn't want to face all that and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So we isolated a lot. We stuck to immediate family and everything. My mother-in-law was alive. She lived nearby, and it was me, my husband, and my mother-in-law, and Daniel, mm -hmm. and stuff. And, um, you know, that was it. That was it. He saw the kids at school. Mm -hmm. And he saw us, and that was it. But I took him places, you know, and things. But we went everywhere alone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was always very tense about uh, what other people would think. Now it's like, hey, people, uh, there are people out there that are so-called normal that behave a lot worse than my kid, okay, and stuff. Um, not just behavior, physical behavior-wise, but... Uh, Character-wise and things like that, it's like um, he can go anywhere. I had um, I took him to see um, a play, a Matilda. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, he wanted to go see it and everything. And um, 
I had told him, I gave him a lecture on the train going into the theater and stuff um, about how to behave. You know, you're going to sit quietly. You're not going to react. You're not going to do this and that. We got to the lobby, and there were other little kids there, and they're running around and jumping and screaming and everything. I looked at them, and I looked back at my son, and I said, you just be you, honey. That's it, and um, that's it. And we proceeded to have a great time mm -hmm. and stuff. So um, everybody be yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a learning experience. It takes you to a different place. Mm -hmm. You meet different people, mm -hmm. um, and you um, you are enriched in a way. Mm -hmm. But there's still, like you said, you need to, like you said in the book, you need to take some time to get out, take a walk, mm -hmm. go to a movie. Mm -hmm. Just and it's hard sometimes. Um, it it is. You have to. You feel guilty and everything like that, and it's like um, you can't drink from an empty bowl you know, from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. You have to fill, you have to replenish it. You'll burn out, and this is a long distance run. This is a true marathon and stuff. I'm, uh, it dawned on me at some point that I was gonna be doing this the rest of my life. You, ha so, you yeah. have to have parent groups and yeah. stuff, you know, whether it's a parent support group or a PTA or um, an advocacy group or something like that, right. something like Ability Fierce right. or That's whatever. Right, that's why I'm putting this on TV. Right. So if people out there are like, and you can get in touch with us and mm -hmm. talk to us and say, look, I, I felt that too or I'm mm -hmm. overwhelmed. Um, because it, it's, it, it's, it, it's not right. If people are entitled to getting services they should get them, mm -hmm. and they should get them in time. As the kids grow up, two years to wait for something is two years that the kid's not developing. Right. And these aren't the same as when you're 40, 40, 42, there's not a big difference. Mm. Seven and nine, there's a lot. A, a lot of difference. Yeah. I finally feel like um, everything makes sense. You know, um, like I said, it, it turned out differently from how I expected. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, um, when I, I had uh, a dream when I was pregnant uh, with Daniel about him meeting me at the subway and walking me home and things, and we would talk along the way and everything like that. And I would be so proud to be with my handsome tall son and everything and, uh, and stuff. And I realized I got my dream. It's just a little different. We ride the subway together. We go places. Uh, we went to a hockey game. We had a lot of fun and, and stuff. Another um, disruption of stereotypes and everything. Black people don't play hockey and stuff and don't watch hockey either. But we had a ball at the Rangers game and everything like that. And. Um, we got separated. We took a restroom break, mm. and I told him to meet me back at a certain location, and he got confused. Um, hey, it's Madison Square Garden and stuff, and he went somewhere else. He went in the opposite direction. But uh, after I had a few seconds of panic, I started to look for him, and there he was coming back with me with an usher in tow and everything else. He was able to solve his problem. Right. So tell me a little bit more about your writing. What would you like to know? Well, okay, so you've got the book. Mm -hmm. Can people buy it? or it's Yes, yeah. it's available on Amazon.com okay. uh, in print like this or in a Kindle edition. The e-book, yeah. Right, and, and stuff. And um, I have some other books, that uh, one that's on there already on Amazon, and I'll be putting some more up um, in the coming year and everything, um, I decided that uh, rather than I was going to devote some energy to promoting my own work and everything, actually finishing what I started mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but you know, this is because I read it and it resonated with me mm -hmm. and I know it's going to resonate with a lot of other parents. It, there's not a lot of like practical advice. No, but, no. But but even that is something to know you're not alone because right. for a lot of parents it's a very lonely 
Right. I, um, th there are lots of books out there that give the practical advice mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, uh, in fact, I think in here I actually say at one point that every doctor has, uh, for every doctor there is a different opinion and everything. Everybody's got one and stuff about whether your child has autism or your child has whatever and, um, you know, what you should do about it and everything like that. I, I don't have any advice. I, I have my experience. I can tell you what worked for me and how I felt in the process and everything like that. But I think each of us has to find our own answers and stuff and, you know, pe and share that experience and, and things and, um, you know, what works and what doesn't work. So when I was in the midst of this whole crazy thing with my son this summer, one of the reporters from the New York Post said, stop talking about the legal, the legality of it. Mm -hmm. Talk about the emotions. Emotions. And he was right. Mm -hmm. Because I see so many people, I have and, and one of the Ability Fierce little news things I made, a, a woman comes up and says, I guess it's not possible because of budget cuts or she's already conceding mm. what they're selling her. They're saying, mm. you know, no, you have to say, find the budget. You mm -hmm. have to, and uh, it's what I'm always saying is when the problem is yours, they're not going to solve it. But if you make it their problem, mm -hmm. it can be solved. But the thing is, if we make it their problem and they solve the problem, it's going to end up being cheaper for society, mm -hmm. and we're going to have a better society. Right. Right? Right now, we're in a really bad place where people are talking about shareholder value. And mm -hmm. greed is, I mean, this was from the right. 80s, greed is good, but it's just taken to this, we have a division of wealth that is more extreme than any mm -hmm. time since the Great Depression. We, we have lost our compassion, we have lost our humanity, mm -hmm. our character, mm -hmm. and everything else. And we have to go reclaim it, right? And when people start using the acronyms and the 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 initials, they're buying into the system, right? You're not going to change it when you speak the language of bureaucracy, right? You're going to change it when you speak the language of human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, I, I, computer analogies are really good. When computers were starting, and or personal computers. People like my mother and people would say, I don't know anything about computers. Should I learn about computers? I said, no, because when you need computers, they're going to be so easy you'll understand mm -hmm. them. The interface is user-friendly. Right. Right now, the interface for disability services is, is not user-friendly. User right. And uh, we need to get a makeover. So instead of a DOS uh, line command, we have a nice Apple mm -hmm. iPhone. Right. And we don't have to know all the stuff that goes right. on. Right. I don't have to see the sausage being made, okay? Yeah, yeah. Right. And you know. then if politicians wa think they can do it cheaper, do it cheaper. But make sure that the, the person is, you're not, you're not sure changing don't the person. Yeah. If, the, you can do, if you can give the person dignified services in a timely manner, I don't care how much, it, if you can make it cheaper, that's great. Mm -hmm. But now what they do is they sell you something and they say, we're doing the system to improve it. But what's really happening in many cases, there's lobbies from agencies and nursing mm -hmm. homes in Albany. And they're increasing the bureaucracy and they're not really and, improving and the services. And they're making money by mm -hmm. denying services or delaying them. Right. You know what I mean? We're telling the time we started asking for services and got services mm -hmm. five years. Oh, yeah. Five years. Five years that c took a terrible toll on my marriage, took mm -hmm. a terrible toll on my job. Why does that, what, what, what's right about that? Right. You Especially know? when you're dealing with children. Right. Because time is a factor mm -hmm. in their development. Uh, one more thing that I want to say if we have time. Mm -hmm. um, at that meeting, that we met at and everything. I, I mentioned to you that, you know, uh, the state had all these pictures of people of color, children of color with disabilities and mm -hmm. things like that, and adults uh, and, and things. Uh, but the audience was mostly white and stuff. 
uh, in the public schools in District 75, there is a predominance of people of color mm -hmm. in those um, things. And one of the issues, you know, you ask why parents don't show up, is I think part of the stigma is that, you know, um, the mainstream culture wants males of color to be in special education. That's a problem and stuff. There's a stereotype that we're sort of like shoving them in there and everything like that. So um, that's not to say that people don't need the services and stuff, but not everyone who's there maybe should be there or maybe needs to be in a less restrictive environment and stuff. You have to add um, appropriately assess people. Mm -hmm. And and things like that, and um, help families um, navigate cultural differences. Right, and stuff. right. And the cultural differences in New York are amazing. Right, because you've got people. The school that I went to for the meeting of the District Seventy Five Council. Mm -hmm. meeting, first of all, the twenty four thousand people in District Seventy Five. There were less than twenty four parents there. Right, okay, right. So that's bad rep representation. And then there were people from. China, there were issues with translation. People aren't getting, mm -hmm. so th this is special to New York. The, the race issue, nobody wants to talk about it. Right. Uh, but it's, there, you know, there, there is still a significant amount of black people who are feeling the weight of slavery. The, the 40 acres and a mule was never, mm -hmm. that would have gone some way to, to creating, but you have a class that the education, the income, the the status in society is uh, is marginalized, and then you have a disabled kid. You're doubly marginalized, right? And nobody wants to talk about that, right? You know, um, and you, so, and then people say, "Well, you want to fix everything?" Yeah, yeah. Let's let's yeah, let's, 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 let's fix let's everything. Fix yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> let's get it done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This has been Disability Fierce with my guest, Cheryl Singleton Lynch. We've had a really good talk. Please check out her stuff. It's, it's available on Amazon. Um, like I said, it's not practical advice, but you're going to feel, if you have a kid with a disability, you're going to feel like, hey, I know that story. And um, it helps. It, it, it makes me feel good to know that other people are going through the same issue if only because it means there's a lot of us out there who are going to work to change it. And that's the thing. It's only any good if we fix it. It's not, it's not good if we just keep going through the system, you know, I got mine and you're on your own for yours. No, let's get it. Let's, let's bring everyone up. Let's make this a society that we're proud of how we treat our people and not how much money we have. Thank <laughs> you.